Shalom everyone. It is December 9th. We are one day early, but we are going to celebrate Hanukkah. Hanukkah begins in the year 2020 at sundown December 10th. That's Thursday night, December 10th. And we love to incorporate Hanukkah into uh, our time of celebration because it is a remembrance of the miracles of God in behalf of the Jewish nation. Throughout their history, we see that without God's hand on the Jewish person, there would be no Jew alive today. Satan has a special vendetta to wipe the Jew off the face of the map to get rid of Israel because then Messiah has nowhere to return. He thinks he can win. I have news for him. Mm -hmm. um, as someone once said, the, the Jewish people have so many incidents in their history that uh, they tell about a battle or whatever, you know, is going on. They win. Let's eat. <laughs> and then they repeat it again. Uh, it's kind of a light way of looking at it, but the idea behind it is that we've seen this repetitive. We're going to talk about the time period around 165 B.C. That reminds me to ask everyone, even if you're out in the audience, if your mic is on, mute your phones, please. Um, I believe I did mine, so hopefully it will behave. But as I was saying, uh, our, our story today stems from the era of about 165 BC. I'm going to go back a little more in history than that to bring you up to date quickly. And then we're going to look at the fact that even though this is a long standing tradition of celebration, it has vital meaning to us today. It has a meaning that is ageless that uh, we want to bring out. So we'll, we'll be looking at two parts, our historical and our celebration today of how we, we recognize all that this involves. Bless you, by the way. <laughs> okay, let's go back a little further. Let's go back to 336 BC, and we have Alexander the Great. Had I thought about it, I could have brought you out a comparison of Alexander the Great and Yeshua. It's very interesting. But I won't take the time now. If we have time on the other end, I'll call up my notes and do it because I can't do it just off the top of my head. But 336 BC, Alexander the Great had come into power as the world emperor. He was very high-minded. He was uh, quite a, a, a cultured emperor, and he wanted that culture to be worldwide for him. The culture that he was reflecting was the Greek civilization. So he wanted the nations under him to not lose their identities, but to embrace also the Greek culture. He brought the language. He brought the, the cultural, he brought uh, the biggest library to Alexandria. We're talking books in, in the 300s BC, and it, we're talking a huge, huge library. In fact, the Septuagint, the Greek version of the Hebrew scriptures, the Tanakh, what you call the Old Testament, came during this time period, probably a, a little later than, than the 300s, but somewhere between the 1st century and 3rd century B.C., the Septuagint was written in Greek because that was the language that was being established. For those that were of Jewish um, ethnicity, embracing the Greek culture, they came to be known as Hellenists. Hellenists were Greek-speaking Jews, and as they had moved out further away from the temple area, you have Jews in Alexandria, you have, you have Jewish people in areas further away from the temple, they were quick to embrace the culture around them. They were almost losing their Jewish identity, which is the downside to it, but the upside was there were many benefits that they received from the Greek culture. So it had its pros and it had its cons. Well, Alexander goes on his way because we find that he passes away, and he was so great in being emperor that no one really could carry the weight of being world emperor. So the world was divided up among his four generals. It was divided into uh, different empires, I'll say, I'll call them four little empires, and Israel did not have an empire of its own. It would ended up with, for the next I'm going to say at least 100 years, if not a little bit longer. It had the, the oh, what word do I want? The disdain of being attached either to Egypt, which was the country, if it was powerful, to their south, or Syria to the north. What I want you to see on a simple map is Syria north of Israel, 
the land of Israel and Egypt south of Israel. <clears throat> so when the, the Ptolemies were in control, they came out of the Egyptian area. When Egypt was one of the stronger uh, empires, then Israel was under Egyptian control. And the same was true with Syria. When Syria, the Seleucids, were more in control, then they um, affected Israel and how Israel would go. Now, usually, not always, but usually when Syria had control, there was, uh, no, I'm sorry, when Egypt had control, there was a little more um, live and let live, a little more than when the Seleucids were in control. But what we're going to deal with is what, is an effect to us today with Hanukkah. Roger, can I ask you to put the fan on? I'm starting to broil, and it's probably me. I'm in a sweatshirt because it says Happy Holidays. <laughs> <laughs> Had to wear it today. <laughs> but uh, forgive me, I just, I thought if I'm this warm, I think it's starting to feel warm to some of my people in my um, current, in my, in my real audience. That sounds bad. You all are real people. <laughs> I don't mean that. Physical the wrong way. audience. Physical audience. Yeah, that will do it. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And thank you for helping, Roger. Appreciate mm -hmm. it. He's always the one behind the scenes. Mm -hmm. Those of you who have been looking for a website for a more uploaded, go to the bit.ly site. There's a lot more put on it now. He's been playing a lot of catch up. Lord bless him. He's worked hard. So, And we got somebody else coming in. <laughs> That's the, the doorbell. Anyway. It's not the real, it's the Zoom doorbell, oh, yeah. oh. but we have to, Zoom won't let them in now without uh, a layer of security, so they have to ding dong and then we have to let them in. So forgive me for all of that, but let me bring you back into the time before they had electricity and doorbells. I saw her okay. at Casey Petty's today. <laughs> oh, yeah. You can tell on her later. <laughs> I asked okay. her if she was coming and she said no, but, oh. but she's on that. Okay, well. Then maybe that's what she meant, not in person. Yeah. yeah. Okay, back to uh, before about 200 BC. We have the time now that Alexander the Great has divided, his kingdom has been divided, and at this point in time, uh, Syria has the, the upper hand in the area that's reflecting Israel. <laughs> In this area, we have Antiochus IV come to power. Now, you may hear his name Antiochus. I have no idea. So if I'm pronouncing it wrong, forgive me, but Antiochus is what I grew up hearing, so it's how I'll slip into saying it. He was on the throne of Syria. He thought himself high and mighty. He about tried to deify himself, which means to make himself a god. So instead of calling himself Antiochus IV, he called himself Antiochus Epiphanes. Epiphany is God made manifest. You'll hear somebody say they had an epiphany. God appeared to them. Well, he tried to, to make himself be that God. Now, because of how bad he is and what he does to the Jewish people, they nicknamed him not Epiphanes, but Epimenes, <laughs> which means the mad one. <laughs> the Meshuggah one, okay, the crazy one, which really does fit him better. He embroiled himself in wars because he wanted his empire to grow. He went down into Egypt, so he's crossed through Israel into Egypt because he wanted to take control of Egypt also. Then he'd have quite a block. Well, unfortunately for him, this is the time that Rome was starting to rise up. And there was a Roman ambassador by the name of Gaius, and I'm going to slaughter this name also, Papilius Lanus. I really don't know how to say it, but I bring it out in case if you run into historians that will tell you the last name is spelled L-A-E-N-A-S. Okay? We've all heard the expression, you, the, you draw a line in the sand, don't cross that line. Well, we think it probably stemmed from him, because basically what he did in 168 B.C., when Antiochus had gone down into Egypt to take control of Egypt, he stood in his way, and he gave him a very strong message from the Roman Senate, not from himself, but from the Senate, opposing this attack and telling him that he was to stop cease and desist, basically. And uh, Antiochus was not, uh, not kind to this comment. So uh, the Roman ambassador, Gaius, I'll call him Gaius, it's far easier for me, he drew in the sand a circle all the way around Alexander. 
And he told him, when he said, Alexander, I'm sorry, Antiochus, sorry, 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 Antiochus. When Antiochus was saying he'd think it over and he'd respond to him later, which was, you know, kind of like a polite way in his face saying, you know, I'm not going to listen to you. He told him, if you step out of this circle, if you cross over the line, I should say it the right way because that's how we get our expression. If you cross over wow. this line without telling us your position, which obviously had to be one of conceding, he says, then all of Rome will come against you. So basically, he said, Rome's going to come in war against you if you don't go back home. So Antiochus pulled back because he was not strong enough to stand against the Roman Empire. He might have thought he could swallow up Egypt, that he could not come against Rome that was rising. And he took his anger out on Israel as he went back home. Now, there had already been his control in Israel. He had given a, a little ability for um, freedom of religion, but not completely. But now, in his anger, this is going to be completely done away with. This was his second expedition to try to take over this area against Rome. And so, really, he's being embarrassed. And he's taking that embarrassment out now on the Jewish people. So, he came into Israel um, declaring that he is God. He is going to put an image of Zeus in their temple and tell them they have to bow down and worship Zeus. He's going to take a, a pig, a non-kosher animal, slay it on the altar at the temple, and then he took the juice, the broth from it, and sprinkled that all over the other artifacts and the other paraphernalia that's used in temple worship. He brought in foreigners to control um, military-wise, uh, probably in other ways also. He renamed cities like Acre instead of Antioch, or I'm sorry, Antioch instead of Acre. Acre was what was there. He changed it to Antioch, which is more of a Syrian name. He declared studying the Torah was prohibited. If you were found with the scrolls, you were put to death. He uh, would no longer let them observe Shabbat, the Sabbath. If they were caught trying to observe, they were put to death. He went so far as to say that they could not circumcise their children. Now remember for Israel, if you didn't circumcise your son, they were cut off from Israel. They were cut off from the commonwealth of Israel. They were out of line with God and they would not be part of his kingdom when Messiah would come. So this was huge to not be able to circumcise their children. And this is Alexander the Great did all No, this. no, Alexander the Great died. His empire split up by four, and one of the four generals was Antiochus, oh, Antiochus okay. Epiphanes. He's the one that did all this. That's doing all That's this. That's doing all this. Oh, okay. Antiochus Epiphanes is the one doing all of it. Um, he put up heathen altars everywhere. He was forcing the Jews to bow down to it. He was forcing them to, um, to use pigs in, in uh, sacrifices. He was forcing them to eat the flesh, which they were literally choking on because... To them, that's how horrible it was. Uh, many, many were slaughtered. Many Jewish people just plain lost their lives on the spot because of trying to counter it and go against it. And uh, some try to say, well, really there was the Hellenists and they were the pagan worshipers and there were the Jews who were worshiping God and, and that that's what this fight was and that Antiochus was trying to put that fight out. But I want you to see that's not really the truth of it. The truth of it was that what Alexander put into motion was a blend, was a mixture, which was, had its pros and cons. But really this was a vendetta of, of Antiochus's anger being taken out on the Jewish people, wanting to subjugate them and make them under his control. So uh, by the time he's raided the temple and put up the false altars and inflicting uh, pagan uh, sacrifices, that was more than the Jewish people could, could handle. Many, like I say, lost their lives. Others fled um, trying to, to survive. Um, this is when the Hasidim, we hear about really in history, the, the Hasidic were the very religious. Um, we have them rebelling. I have to quote my mom, okay? I just have to make this personal. 
my mom used to say when it came to doing work around the house, fixing things, repairing things, my dad made a great preacher. <laughs> yeah, we laugh. <laughs> but you get the idea, okay? <laughs> These religious Hasidim made great preachers, so they made great Torah scholars, but they made lousy warriors. They didn't know how to fight war. Mm -hmm. So they tried to rebel, but they were going down in defeat. However, in Modin, a little community near Jerusalem, outside of Jerusalem, near, near it though, um, there was a, a Jew. This Jew approached the altar that was been put up, a heathen altar, and Mattathias, a very well-known Hasidic priest, saw this Jew starting to make sacrifice according to Antiochus Epiphanes. Well, his blood boiled, and in a fit of anger, he killed that Jew. And then he had to flee for his safety. Well, he had four sons, and this group, um, if, I, if I tell you the sons' names, two of them we know were Judah and Simon. Now, as soon as I say Judah, any of you who have history with Hanukkah think, oh, I know, I know, I know his last name. And if I ask, is there anyone out there brave enough to say what they think Judah's last name was? Maccabee. Maccabee is what they think, but that's not wrong. wrong. Yeah. That was not his last name. I'll tell you how we get the Maccabees, because you hear about the Maccabees. Mm -hmm. I'll tell you as we move on in our story. But these sons did join together, and they got others to join with them, and they were a little more savvy than the, the priest, than their dad and, and the priest. Mattathias does finally pass away from age, and Judah is the, the oldest son, so he's the head of the family, he comes up. But they <laughs> actually knew a little bit of guerrilla warfare. They knew some tactics. They were able to trap the Syrian army. Remember, Antiochus brought in foreigners <laughs> to be the army, so they didn't know Israel. They didn't know the lay of the land. They weren't shepherds knowing the, the hills and the caves and the alleys that came to a, a dead end. And they lured the Syrian army into places where then they could attack and they could win. But here's the defining factor, why they were able to actually carry out a revolt and win back their precious land. And I believe this is what God honored. They raised up their battle cry. You know how you go into battle, you raise your flag, you know, your ensign, your, your name, your, your battle cry. They took it right from the scripture. They took it from the book of Shemot, Exodus 15, 11. And this is, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm starting it in Hebrew rather than English. Let me give it to you in Hebrew first, okay? Micha, mocha, balim, Yahovah. Who is like unto thee, O Lord, our God? In essence, we're coming in the name of our God, and who can stand against our God? That was their battle cry. Does that sound like what little David mm -hmm. said when he went up against Goliath, the giant, and a little boy with a little sling rocked a giant to sleep? We know it was the power of God. Do we see that through Israel's history? Yes. And I believe God honored this battle cry, and because of that, he fought the battles, and a little group of guerrilla warriors pushed back 10,000 plus Syrian army, pushed them out of Jerusalem, out of the Judean hills, and finally completely out of Israel and had their land back. Now, how do we get Maccabee out of that? That Hebrew battle cry from Shemot from Exodus 15:11, Micha, Mocha, Baalim, Yehovah. If you take the first letter off of each of those Hebrew words, you have the M, the C or the K, and the B, and what, the H. I have to look to see how we spell it in our, in our um, English, okay? We have, well, no, a Y on the end, not an H, sorry, a Y. M, C or K, B, and Y. Now, if you look at the word Maccabee, you get the M, the C or the K, the B, and the Y. It became an acronym. It was simply an acronym for their battle cry. So we could say Judah the Maccabee, but not Judah Maccabee. We're right. not saying that that's his first name and his last name. But in that battle cry, uh, actually Judah and, and his name, he was the hammer. And it was said he hammered out the enemy, <laughs> but he hammered him out by the power of our God. And our God in his infinite plan, I don't know how to say it. The plan of 
from before creation said there will never be an end of Israel. So yes, Israel goes into persecution. Israel suffers consequences of not being right with her God, but God never lets her come to an end. And we've got a little tiny group come against the big Syrian army. Hallelujah. Well, once they got Modin back, they got Jerusalem back. As soon as they had Jerusalem back, they wanted to worship their, their God. Obviously, they had a great belief. Remember, they're the Hasidic. We, we know that name down to today. They wanted to immediately start temple worship again. Well, remember what their temple's like? Yeah. The altar has been absolutely desecrated. It is believed that the, the actual stones that made up the altar were taken completely out, that they started all over again and built a brand new altar to the Lord. They started about cleansing the whole temple area, all the paraphernalia that they would need, everything that they would have to have. They went after that first. They did that before they took back their homes, before they cleaned out their homes, before they did anything for themselves personally. They put God first. Mm -hmm. So here is where we get into what we know today because we're still giving you the history that brings you Hanukkah for today. And by the way, this was 165 B.C. Some say 164 B.C. One of those two years for sure. It probably took about three and a half years from when the, the little gorilla family started to when they finally won this victory. Now, the story goes, in the midst of uh, cleaning out the temple, the, according to Leviticus, Diacra, there is always to be a light in the temple. And I'll bring you out that scripture in just a little bit. I've got it in my notes when I come up to our days. So I'll give you that scripture then. Um, I'm looking quick to see if I can find it. And I don't find it quick. So I'll give it to you when I come to it in my notes. Anyway, it says that there's to always be a light in the temple. This light is an eternal light. It is meant to represent God. So, the story goes that as they were cleaning up, they found one little cruise of oil. Remember, lamps, lights in Bible times are olive oil with a wick in it that they light. They found one little cruise that still had the priestly seal on it. So, it meant it was still kosher. It had not been desecrated by Antiochus and his armies. Because they wanted to show God their intent, they said, even though this little cruise will only burn a day, and it's going to take us eight days to make the pure olive oil light, uh, olive oil, the oil out of the olives to, to, oh boy, I'm saying this terribly. So that they could have their light and keep it going, they had to make kosher olive oil for the, for the lighting. It's an eight day process. The cruise they have will last one day. Rather than wait seven days and, and do it and then have the, the pour in the oil so that the light never goes out again, they wanted to show God how serious they were, that he be represented the way scripture says right from the start. So they, they uh, opened up that cruise and they lit it and the story then is told and passed down to us. It's finally in our commentaries, our Talmud and so forth. In the early, early 200 A.D., about maybe early one, the late 100s A.D., but it said that miraculously, that little cruise of oil that should have only lasted one day lasted eight days until the new oil was ready, and they poured in the new oil before the light went out. The light was never extinguished, and because of that, the declaration was given: we want to recognize and celebrate the light every year. Hanukkah means dedication. So they call it the Feast of Dedication because they were rededicating the temple. When they were rededicating it, they were rededicating it back to God. So Feast of Dedication, Hanukkah. Feast of Lights is a nickname for Hanukkah because they're celebrating the lights. I think we've even got a third name and it escapes my mind right now for Hanukkah. But anyway, this is on the 25th of Kislev. That makes it sound a whole lot like December 25th to people. The, the Jewish calendar and the Gregorian calendar that we follow in America here, they do not go that way. It's not that each, each calendar has the same, that, that when we're on the 25th, they're on the 25th. No, it's nothing like that. Yeah. Um, we are almost to Kislev 25 now, and we're on December 9th, you know. So the, the, the time doesn't correlate, and I'll say more about that later also. But... That's one reason given to the celebration 
for eight days for Hanukkah declared from 165 B.C. forward. Now, there are others that say, wait a minute, Jewish people. If that were really true, we should find it in our historical records long before, because you're talking two, three hundred years before it's being recorded. So they looked hard and long at the reasoning behind it, and their reasoning was this. The religious Jews were the ones that gained the victory. They looked at the Jewish calendar according to the Bible. They looked at the holy days each year that they were supposed to be keeping that for three and a half years they had not been able to keep in any way, shape, or form. The last that they had just missed was Sukkot. Sukkot is an eight-day festival. It's a day when they commemorate the miracle of God bringing their people through the wilderness, that they survived 40 years out in the wilderness, their shoes didn't wear out, their clothes didn't wear out, and they got to go into the promised land. So it's a, another time that they see the victory, victory over the Egyptians that they fled from, victory through the wilderness, going into their land, being able to worship their God in the way that they believe that they should. Sukkot is also tied in in Ezra and Nehemiah with the rebuilding and the rededication of that temple that was after the 70-year captivity in Babylon. So with seeing that Sukkot's history is of a miracle of God, seeing that it has to do with rededication of the temple, seeing that it was the last holy day that was just missed, that they had just would have kept had they been able to, some say that they, they did a new Sukkot or a second Sukkot. Again, that they put on an eight-day celebration of the rededication of the temple and God's bringing the Jewish people through to survive, to be alive, to worship him to this day. So, whichever way you go with the story, they still celebrate Hanukkah. Now, notice how the religious Jews looked at the holy days to know what they are to keep and do. And Hanukkah is not listed. How could Hanukkah be listed? Those holy days descriptively are given back in Moshe's day. They're back in our books in, well, we see it in Shemot, in Exodus. We see the majority of it in Biakra, in Leviticus. We have Rosh Hashanah, the Feast of Trumpets. We have Sukkot. We have, you know, these mandated biblical holy days that we celebrate year after year after year after year. But if you go back to Moshe's time, he came out of Egypt with the children of Israel about 1445 B.C. approximately. So you're talking 165 B.C. We're talking 1300 years later. Why would Moshe be given, this is how you keep Hanukkah and call it a religious holy day, but oh, you're not going to have the history to understand this day for 1300 years? You know, that would be like telling us, you all need to start celebrating this day, that's, that's something that's going to happen in the future. You don't do it that way. You celebrate something that's already happened. So it obviously was not going to be mandated by God as a biblical holy day. We don't see it given that precedence there because it happened years later. But do we have anything biblical to tell us yay or nay about Hanukkah? Is it just a fairy tale and we shouldn't have anything to do with it? Obviously not. Historically, we know it to be fact, and we know the facts as I've given them to you uh, to be sound and to be true. We know that there was the, the family that raised up, that Judah was ahead of it. We know their battle cry. We know that's how we got the name Maccabees. We know that it was a little guerrilla army that should in no way have been able to come against the big Syrian army that would have had all the, the weapons of war of the time. What did Israel have next to nothing to fight with? Same again, a, a rock and a sling, you know, obviously. But does that give us a right to celebrate it? Because we are, and you can see I celebrate it, we are celebrating it today. We're keeping the tradition. Are we doing it just to keep a tradition? Well, let me ask you this. If you knew that Yeshua Jesus walked on this earth after the history I've just told you about, and you knew that he celebrated Hanukkah, would you think that'd give us a little bit of credence for celebrating it today? Would, would that kind of be like God's stamp of approval on it, that God's saying, yes, celebrate Hanukkah? I kind of think so, because we don't read in Scripture 
of Yeshua celebrating birthdays. We don't read him celebrating other days, but we do read of his celebration of Hanukkah. Now, all of you who know your Bible have got to be thinking, where is she talking about? I don't read Hanukkah in my Bible. <laughs> if you've been with me, you know the answer. <laughs> it comes out very clear in the Jewish Bible, yes, but it's in your English Bible also. And in fact, because you said it that way, I'm going to call up my tablet. I'm going to open up real quickly. If you want, get your Bibles and go with me to John, Yochanan, a good Jewish boy. Okay, now he wrote with the Greeks in mind. I will give you that. But he is of Jewish background. Uh, oh, good. I've already got it open. I just need to put in where I want. So we're talking about a Jewish boy recording, and he records in his Gospel of John, he records uh, the time of Yeshua's ministry on this earth. John what? I hadn't told you yet. Oh, okay. <laughs> but that tells me she's listening. Yay. Yeah. <laughs> Go with me to John 10. Okay? Yohanan chapter 10. And in fact, the early part of 10 I love because it's the shepherd taking care of his sheep, how his sheep know his own voice, his sheep follow him, he lays down his life for the sheep, all of that's in there prior to this. But you're going to go all the way down to verse 22. In verse 22, you're going to read, and remember this is talking in relation to Yeshua Jesus, at that time, at the time that he's walking on this earth and Yochanan's recording his activities, at that time, the Feast of Dedication took place in Jerusalem. Do you remember what I told you Hanukkah means? Dedication. Feast of Dedication, Feast of Lights, or Festival of Lights, that's the other way we put it. These are all the meanings given to the name for Hanukkah. So when it says the Feast of Dedication took place, the Jewish mind knows that means Hanukkah. Okay, now, Hanukkah is happening, and they're in Jerusalem in Jerusalem, okay? Now, it was winter. Is that the right time? Yes, because Kislev always falls in our December, sometimes even goes into our January before the month of Kislev is over. Um, this year, all of Kislev will fit in our November and December, but it's always in the winter time, okay? So, we've got the fact that it was the Feast of Dedication. They're in Jerusalem. It is winter. And here's your great English Bible for you that's really just going to open it up and make it clear. Verse 23. Uh, it was winter. And Jesus was walking in the temple area in the portico of Solomon. <laughs> now, how come I didn't see light bulbs go on and I didn't see anybody have an aha moment? <laughs> Would that be because you need a little bit of a Jewish background to understand what you just read? Let me give it to you in our complete Jewish Bible. Verse 22 makes it very clear. Then came Hanukkah in Jerusalem. It was winter, and Yeshua was walking around inside the temple area in Shlomo's colonnade. Now, again, I don't see my Gentile audience go, oh, I get it. But for every Jewish mind that's been taught in their background, aha, the moment's come. The colonnade, he's walking in the temple area in Shlomo, that's Solomon, by the way, in Solomon's colonnade in what you call the portico. Well, if I put that into Gentile vernacular in your church today, and I said, Jesus came into the church, and he went into the fellowship hall, and he hung around in the fellowship hall. Would you get the idea? Yeah. Oh, in yeah. the fellowship hall. That's where we do our celebrations. That's where we have our potlucks. Mm -hmm. That's where we have, you know, where we're not doing our religious service, but we are celebrating something <clears throat> about our religious beliefs. That's what this is saying. When he was in Shlomo's colonnade, at Hanukkah time, the Feast of Dedication, he was celebrating Hanukkah in the temple with his Jewish brethren. There is what that actually means from the Hebrew. Now you have your aha moment. Did Yeshua Jesus celebrate Hanukkah? Yes. Loud and clear. One of the few things that, that is spelled out in a way that I think the Lord knew we were going to need it in years in the future. The Lord always so gives us what we the need. Bible, but Christmas is man-made, because it's Christ not mentioned in the Bible. <laughs> the day Christmas is man-made, what it stands for is very biblical. 
it stands for the birth of Christ, the birth of Messiah, the birth of Yeshua. That we all do celebrate, the who love our Lord, the who are in relation with him. Did it happen on December 25th? Highly unlikely. Do I care about that and say, oh, I'm not going to celebrate this day because it's the wrong date? It is the wrong date. No. I'm going to take this opportunity to a world that doesn't usually listen to me, and I'm going to run it up the flagpole, and I'm going to celebrate it as big and loud as I can. God came into the world. The child was born. His name was Yeshua, or his name was Jesus. I'm not going to get hung up on a day and miss getting the point across to my unsaved world that needs to hear and know it. So, do I have any problem? No. Did I just step on toes? I'm sure my bigger audience, yes. And my intent is not. You go by your conviction between you and the Lord. But for me, it's an opportunity. For me, I want to share it with the world. I want to recognize the fulfillment of the Jewish prophecies of Isaiah 7.14 that said a virgin would conceive. That Isaiah 9.6 says that a, a son would be born, I'm sorry, a son would be given. The child would be born, but the son would be given. I want to celebrate my prophet Micah, Micah who said out of Bethlehem would come one who was from of old from eternity past. I want to celebrate all this fulfillment and shout it to the world, what God promised he did. And this one who is born of Jewish ethnicity in his human side is deity. He is very God himself, and that's why he is the savior of the world, not just the Jewish people. He came for the world, for God so loved the world. He came for all. So am I going to take an opportunity, a day? I don't care what day. You can make it in August. You can make it in January. I don't care where you put it. I'm going to say, hey, world, wake up. Go tell it on the mountain. Shout it out. Let it go down to the valley and let it spread. Hear it loud. Hear it clear. Jesus, Yeshua, the Son of God promised was born. He was born for Hallelujah. our salvation. Yes. He was born to die. How do you Jesus. like that one? Mm. Any of you choose to be born to die? You don't even choose where you're born. And yet he did. Who cares what day it was? Exactly. The fact is, it happened. And yes. that's my whole point. It's the same yes. and I worship will not. the day you worship on. Some worship Saturday, some worship Sunday. And we have. But it doesn't matter what day, just so we remember him. Old Paul said remember. that very clear. Honor a day unto the Lord. Whatever the Honor day it. of the week. Honor it. Honor it. Yes. So, yes, I will take the opportunity and uh, have had the blessing of sharing with a wider world, both Jew and Gentile, because I've brought it into my home and spread it out. And I'm not holding me up on a pedestal. That's a whole lot of us that have done it. So, back on track though, this is a um, particular date that we do have in history. It is the celebration, whether we celebrate the cruise of oil or we celebrate the victory of the little army against the big Syrian army, however you want to put it, we celebrate it. The fact that Yeshua celebrated it gives to me the stamp of approval on its celebration. Now, in our holy days, very often we're given a picture of Messiah in those holy days. That was the purpose of them. The easiest for you all to see is Passover because you've gone through Messiah and the Passover with me. And you know how the symbolism of the foods that we eat and the things that we do, and the moths in itself, mind-blowing, how anyone could go through our Athakoman and not see that that's Messiah. It just screams it out. So our holy days were for a purpose. They were foreshadowing. They were teaching. They were telling. They were looking toward the cross. Do we see anything in Hanukkah that jumps out like that, that shouts out about our coming Savior, our coming Messiah? And I will say yes, 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 and the rest of my class will be dedicated to that today. So in light of that, that's another layer why I think God has 
encouraged us to celebrate this, this, this special time. And because it is called the Festival of Lights, because it was the rededication of the temple and putting the light in the temple, I do look at it from a light perspective. And I do believe that, that uh, we can see our Messiah through the light of Hanukkah. Mm -hmm. Now let me back up what I'm saying, okay? Because I want to prove to you, and I'll prove it to you with Scripture, what I am saying. I think I gave you everything that I need to in history. Let's go in now to what we celebrate, how we celebrate Hanukkah. First of all, if we're going to be talking about light, I want us to think about light, because if I asked you for your definition of light, it could fall into three different categories, and you would all be right. I could ask some of you, and you would come up with the noun, the natural agent that stimulates sight and makes things visible. The light of the sun makes things visible. That's a noun. It's illumination, it's brightness, it's luminous, um, glaze, blaze, dazzle, all of that. Okay, that's a noun. You're right. But someone else may give you the verb form of it. They might give you the definition that it is illuminating something. The room was lighted by a small lamp. The little room was illuminated by the virgin's lamp. In this way, it's talking about a verb form. It's not talking about the noun light. It's talking about the verb light. We can see both. Now let me throw the curve in and give you it in a form as an adjective. Have you ever described somebody with the light brown eyes or the light blue eyes? Do you really mean that light as noun or that light as verb? No, but you mean it as an adjective, a descriptive word. The, the eyes obviously are lighter in color than some others, and you're doing a comparison. So light can be a noun, it can be a verb, and it can be an adjective. And I'll say yes, yes, and yes. Okay, but I want to broaden our minds to think more of light and try to keep that in mind as we go through our days now, noun, verb, and adjective, because you'll see it in different ways. And I guarantee you, if you start opening yourself up to the light in this next week or so as you're thinking about different things, it's going to pop up in your mind, you know, like the light bulb goes on. <laughs> hmm, interesting analogy. Okay, why am I saying all this? Because we're going to see the light of the world, and we're going to see it in relation to Hanukkah. Okay, I've told you the history behind Hanukkah. Let me tell you that our Jewish people love to celebrate Hanukkah. Mm -hmm. It is a festive, it is a happy, it is a joyous occasion. Not all of our holy days give us that chance to just be joyful and celebrate. We do say Hag Sameach, which is happy holiday, and we have all kinds of ways to rejoice. Now, as is always true with our Jewish holy days, with our, our remembrances, we teach them to our children. We teach them repetitively. So every year, the, the parents in the home are going to teach the children the history of Hanukkah as I've given it to you. Of course, they make it simple when they're real little, and as they grow, they, they you know, and they give more and more of the detail. But they're going to help the children remember by adding things to, of use to help them. So, because they take the story of the cruise of oil um, burning for the eight days, they're going to focus around that thought, and they're going to bring light into the home. Now, you're all familiar with the, the menorah in the temple, the seven-branched candle stand? That's not a Hanukkah. That's not for Hanukkah, okay? I have a menorah. This one is a Hanukkah. Now, they can come in all kinds of shapes and colors and designs and everything from, I've seen Disney put one out that has Mickey Mouse and Donald Duck and, you know, all the different characters holding the place for a candle a day. I've seen them made out of sports, a basketball, a football, a baseball. I've seen them elegant and I've seen them made out of clay. I've seen them all kinds of ways. So, I just happened to grab one that, that's just a little... Um, 
it's pretty but it's simple so that my point can come across today. The Hanukkah is easy to, to see in its description from the menorah that's in the temple all the time by how many lights can be held on it. As I turn this to you, hopefully you see that there are nine, four and four, and there's always one that's raised higher than the eight. Now, the the you can have all eight on one side and have the one raised over here. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. But you have to have one that's raised, and you have to have eight that are the same. Okay? As soon as you can count nine, you have yourself a Hanukkah. You no longer just have a menorah. You have a Hanukkah because it's for Hanukkah. So we put away or put aside our menorahs that we use in the temple, and we bring out the Hanukkah. If you're wondering why, it's very easy to explain. We're not talking about the, the menorah in the temple. We're talking about the eight days that the, that the light lasted, or the eight days that has been passed down tradition to celebrate, and we're going to explain the ninth in just a moment. But the family's going to gather around the Hanukkah, they're going to light it every night. I'll explain how as I go through the days. They're going to sing songs, and they are fun songs. They're upbeat. They're, they're, they're enjoyable. A lot of the songs are around something called a dreidel. I have a dreidel here. Looks a lot, there we go, <laughs> looks a lot like a top. top that spins, okay? And it does spin, uh -huh. and it falls, and on all four sides are Hebrew letters. The Hebrew letters stand for the sentence, a great miracle happened there. Now, if you buy an Israeli dreidel, one of these letters is different in appearance because in Israel, their dreidel say a great miracle happened here. So, you can know, if you know your Hebrew, you know whether you're buying one made in Israel or anywhere else in the world. But usually, because we're in more places than Israel, we've got the ones that are saying a great miracle happened yeah. there. <laughs> <laughs> Roger went and put on his uh, Hanukkah shirt. Oh, yeah. You gotta show the camera, cause the, show the camera, cause the one now. There's his Hanukkah shirt. <laughs> so that's what the audience here was like. <laughs> Let's get lit. Light it up, okay? Now, they'll spin this dreidel like a top and play a game. If a certain letter comes up, oh, everybody starts with money. But guess what kind of money they start with? Chocolate. Mmm, he said it. <laughs> chocolate. Ooh. It's called gelt, and that means chocolate money comes in little, little um, packets. That's where, that came from. That's where it came from. <laughs> I can't, yeah. And this one has a menorah on one, it has some Hebrew writing on another, but if you open up these inside, it has yummy chocolate made yummy. in Israel. The best is made oh. in Israel. <laughs> there are some that are from around here, but tell, let me tell you, if you can get a leet made in Israel, oh, oh, that's it's delicious. Do they know why it's called goat? Why is it called? Oh. Yeah, because it's Say it loud. <laughs> Go ahead, Roger. If you eat too much of it, you feel guilty. Oh, Ooh. did you hear him? He said, why is it called guilt? Because if you eat too much, you feel guilt. <laughs> As in guilt. <laughs> and the Jewish mom is always good about making you feel guilty. <laughs> but they have fun. So the kids are given an amount of money to start with, the chocolate guilt. And as they play the game, if a certain letter comes up, they might have to put one of their chocolate pieces in the pod, or they win half the pod, or they don't do anything. And they either play for a time or until someone wins it all, whichever way they want to do. But it's fun. It's a fun game, and believe me, my the, my kids, as I call them, they're my family, you know. They uh, enjoy playing dreidel growing up. And as the dreidel's being played, they're lighting the candles. Well, they light the candles first. They sing the songs. They play the dreidel. And they eat foods fried in oil to remember the miracle of the oil. So they eat what's called a potato latke. Mm. It's a lot like a, yes, mm, I'm getting hungry today. <laughs> it's a lot like a potato pancake. Um, it's potato and onion, basically. And then uh, the, however the individuals, you know, season it for themselves. And it's fried in that oil. They also eat sufgoniot. Now, don't you all want that right now? <laughs> but if I told you that's a jelly donut fried in oil, mm -hmm. now how many want to eat it? <laughs> okay, yeah, really. these are the traditions. How did a top get into this? Why the dreidel? The history behind the dreidel is during that time period, from 168 to 165, when they were under such attack that if they were found with the scrolls, they were automatically killed. It was a death sentence. Oh, 
before all the scrolls were taken away from them, some who realized what was happening hid scrolls in some of the caves in, in the area around Jerusalem. And it, we are told, and I believe it to be true, that the Jewish people would go to those caves. And in fact, some of them were hiding out in the caves for their lives. But if the Syrian army came along, Rather than be caught with the scrolls, they would quickly hide. In fact, usually they had one scroll and everybody poured around it to be able to study it because it was so important to them. You know, you don't realize the value of the Word of God till it's confiscated from you or till somebody tries to take it from you. And, you know, what's hidden in your heart is all that you can keep no matter what. So that's how important it is to get God's Word in your heart. These people who were told learned how to read Hebrew sideways, upside down, whatever direction they could get in, they were around that Word of God. But they might hear the Syrian army coming on horseback, you know, the ones that would patrol through to be keeping order and all of that. So they had these little clay tops that they would act like they were spinning and playing a gambling game. And the Syrians would see that, think that's all they were doing, leave them alone, and go on looking for those who were being disobedient to Antiochus' law. So that's how the dreidel story came to be part of our story. And it was something that could be formed very cheaply. You know, it didn't cost money. They had plenty of clay right there, clay and water. There's a song, you know, that, that talks about making the, the dreidel. It's got to dry. When it's dry and ready, then, then they can play and they spin the dreidel. So uh, it fits, you know, that, that this is what they would be using. And that's why it's part of the story. So um, as I'm saying, the kids are being taught... Um, all the meaning behind it and as they're singing as you will see which I'll be doing very shortly as you see the candles being lit one more each night it shows how the miracle got bigger and bigger and bigger and mm -hmm. the whole thing becomes a glow well we also see in our representation of Messiah we're going to see that picture grow each night until it's fully contained also and in that I see the value of this holiday being celebrated by Yeshua because I've already read to you in John 10 how he celebrated Hanukkah. But let me take you back a couple chapters to chapter 8. You probably don't even need to look this up because if you've been around the Word of God for a while, you probably have this verse memorized. I will read it out of the complete Jewish Bible um, and see if it sounds any different to you. I don't think it'll sound much different. The first word, yes, Yeshua, but you all know who Yeshua is. Yeshua spoke to them again. I quote, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light which gives life. Now hold on to that verse because it's packed for our Hanukkah. And we're going to see it, and we're going to see it, and we're going to see it. And when we get done, if you can ever read that verse and not think of Hanukkah and the menorah yes. again and celebrate it in your heart again, I'll be surprised. Now, did Yeshua say this at the time that they were celebrating Hanukkah? It could be. I can't guarantee that, but it could be. At this time, they had a 75-foot menorah that was lit in the temple area in the um, court of the women that would light Jerusalem all night. They would see that light burning from a distance. It easily could be that he pointed to that 75-foot menorah and said, I am, ooh, Jewish mind, click, mm. click, click, I am. We've heard those words before. That's our God. He's claiming to be our God. And it goes on and says, I am the light of the world. Now there is another time in Sukkot when they have four of these menorahs lit, 75 feet tall in the court of the, the, the women overlooking Yerushalayim that would be seen by the world around them each night. It could have been at that time that the Lord brought it out also. Whichever time, I believe it probably was one of those two times because we often do that when we're teaching to get our points across. We're using object lessons, and it very easily could be that at a time when that menorah was set up and ablaze, that he would use that to say, that's speaking of me. Because remember that eternal light in the temple that's been all the way back from the first temple, the one that was... Before it was called a temple, it was the tabernacle. There was always the eternal light. It was to remind them that they had an eternal God. The one that they wear, the kippah, over their head to remind them, bless you, that they're always in the presence of their holy God who is eternal, who is 
from eternity past through eternity future, that all fits. So our light, when we see light in Scripture, we see our God. We see the one who is called the light of the world. We see this light come into our lives, and we're going to see that this was promised especially. Let me take you real quickly, lest I forget. I may repeat myself later, but let me take you to Yeshia, Isaiah. This is huge in Isaiah. I'm going to take you to chapter 9, Isaiah chapter 9. And you'll begin to see as you come out across other um, scriptures in the original covenant, you will begin to see also um, light mentioned. I love it. You're going to see it in the new light. <laughs> You're going to see it in connection with the light, the one who we're talking about. In, in Isaiah chapter 9 uh, and verse 2, Isaiah is being prophetic. He was a prophet, and he spoke, and he said, The people who walk in darkness will see a great light. Those who live in a dark land, the light will shine on them. Well, what did we read in Isaiah? That he is the light of the world and he came to give light and life to men. Is this a fulfillment of Isaiah 9? I believe it is. I believe this is the promised light. That the light came and walked among them. It dispelled the darkness. And those who see the light, who come into the light, are the ones that the light shines on them and they will not be in darkness again. I love the fact that the light dispels darkness. They're not equals and opposites because darkness flees when the light is brought in. You can't have darkness when you have light. It's impossible. Light, light dispels darkness. So keeping all of this in mind, let's look and see now. We're going to talk about what the days mean. I've given you the background. I told you how they have fun, how they celebrate, um, what all has been passed down. I think we're ready for our days. Uh, I told you about the... The dreidel. I'm just looking over my notes to make sure that I have given you. I think I have. Okay, so they have developed the Hanukkah to celebrate for Hanukkah time. I've already pointed out it has the eight places, but it has one raised. The one that is raised is called the Shamash candle. Now, in my father's tradition, and he was Orthodox Jewish in his upbringing, in his tradition, the shamash candle was always pure white. Okay, the other candles can be eight colors, but the, the shamash candle was always pure white. Now, I've heard other Jewish people say, well, we didn't do it that way. Mm -hmm. What can I say? We love our traditions, and we have our traditions within our families. Uh -huh. But his being Orthodox carries a little more weight to me because the Orthodox were trying to stay true and pure to the word of God. So I'm going to use a white light for my, um, my, okay, I'll tell you right now what it's called. This is called the shamash, okay, S-H-A-M-A-S-H, -A -A -S -H. shamash, okay, shamash, shamash means servant. This is going to be the servant candle. It is going to be used to light all the other days. Could you repeat, spell it again? Yes, shamash, S H. A M, that's M as a mom. <laughs> A S H. A F H. A S H. Shamash. It means servant. It means servant. That's wow. the Hebrew word for servant. Okay. And Irma's already going wow because her mind's already <laughs> ahead of what I'm going to be spelling out, and I love that because it shows. Am I reading into this? No, it's what's there. The shamash candle, the servant candle, will light all the other candles. You know what? I'm going to spell it out. And we'll just take it from this point. When we realize Yeshua, the one that we're saying is the light of the world, he stooped down from heaven to bring the light into our lives. When this candle stoops down and lights the others, it's called the servant candle. Messiah came to be the servant of us all. He didn't come to be king he came to be servant. He came to bring the light. He'll come his second time to be king, to come ruling and reigning in all his glory. But he set aside the glory of his kingship, and he had on the, the robe of the servant, and he acted in that capacity. Even when he said he was the light of the world, it's the servant lighting 
question. On the menorah, is the candle that is used, the one candle that is used to light the other candles, it is, is that also called a shamash candle? It would be called shamash because it's the servant candle that okay. serves the other, so it would be. Usually in the menorahs in the temple, it's all one. In fact, the temple menorah was one piece. It was, it was beat out is how it is, is used when we read about it in the tabernacle. My point being, it flowed from the one to fill up the lights of the other. So they would be pouring in the oil through the servant candle to light the others. Ah. But it's all one. Ah. I love watching the lights <coughs> come on. <laughs> I love it. Why okay. You never told us okay. This <laughs> well, if you've been with me in Hanukkah, you've heard of it. Sometimes we hear so much we can't catch yeah. it. Yeah. Exactly. You know? exactly. And that's yeah. why it's good to repeat. I'm learning. Yeah. That, yeah. Believe me, here. I learn. I see. Yeah. I'll see yeah. new scriptures this year that I haven't seen in other years. I'll see yeah. a new meaning and new depth. Wherever we are, that's what I love yes. about the Word of God. The yeah. depth of the Word of God. You can go over a verse your thousandth yes. time yeah. and something yes. new will jump out. And sometimes it's so simple you think, why did didn't I see that before? And other times it's so profound that you realize how you've had to grow in your walk to get to that depth. But that's the word of God. The gospel is simple enough for a little child to understand it and believe. And it is, I don't want to say complicated enough, but deep enough, deep enough for the mind that needs something to, you know, that shows how great, that, that this just isn't fluff made up. It has that depth. Yes. So that you can have your rocket scientists yes. bow the knee yes. to the Savior God, the Creator. Oh, he doesn't give us more than we can handle at exactly. any one time. No, no. He knows just how much. So much. He knows well, just how much. Yes. Yes. Oh, what an awesome so, year. <laughs> what they will do, and I've got a copy of it, since you're all liking all of this so much, <laughs> um, they will also say a prayer over the candles. I'm just going to read the first part in Hebrew, then I'll do the rest in, in English for you. But they read it. Um, each night they will recite the prayer. I've got other prayers also. We'll see how much I bring out. But the common that's given... Um, and they will use it, like even on Shabbat, this, these candles, if I remember right, I think the Hanukkah is lit first. Don't quote me on that. But anyway, they'll still do the Hanukkah lights also. Um, it, in, in the Hebrew, Baruch HaTah Adonai, Eloheinu Melch HaLom, Asher Kedoshonu, B'Mezvetah, B'Tzivonu, L'Hadlik Ner Shel Hanukkah. It's the first verse. What I have just said is, we praise you, O Lord our God, King of the Universe, who has sanctified us by your commandments and enjoined us to kindle the Hanukkah lights. He's joining with us in it. Then they go on and they say, We praise you, O Lord our God, King of the universe, who performed wondrous deeds for our ancestors in days of old at this season. We're recalling, you did this for our people in 165 B.C., those of us who are keeping it in 2020, mm -hmm. we are keeping an over 3,000-year-old tradition. How's that? You want to be part of a, a tradition? Try 3,000 years' worth. Mm -hmm. And when we celebrate Passover, Pesach, going back to 1445 B.C., if we're even further back. Just, it grows. Our third verse of our prayer is, We praise you, O Lord our God, King of the universe, who has given us life sustained us and enabled us to reach this season. Now keep that in mind as I go into the days. And I will tell you, when you have three Jewish people, yeah. you have four opinions. <laughs> <laughs> we all know that. We all laugh at that. If you get your notes from a different rabbi, they may have a different meaning for a day or a different order or whatever. But this, again, is what's been passed down to me. It's precious to me because of the, my heritage and where I came from. And in this, we will see something that I've just brought out to you. Because I'm going to light our first day. And uh, and by the way, they have real pretty candles, and they have some that aren't so pretty. My box is a little of both. But I'll start with a blue, because blue is Israel. They will light the menorah from right to left. Remember how Hebrew grow? grows? It <laughs> goes right. right to left. So if I'm... Facing my audience, this is my right. And all you see me do is I'm sticking sticky stuff because my menorah has um, 
you can use a little different size candle so it just helps it stand. Okay, so the very first night after saying the prayers, the kids are all gathered around. They've been telling the history of it. And then they will light the shamash candle, the servant candle. Then they take the servant candle and it stoops down to light day one. As they're lighting day one, the father teaching the children, he's like the priest of the family, remember, says, day one stands for light or life. Either way, light or life. Um, it depends on which rabbi or some will incorporate both reasons. Light causes us to reflect on the words of Melch David, of our King David. In Tehillim, in Psalm 119.105, he said, Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. Our prophet Yeshaya said, and that's Isaiah, said, Come, house of Yaakov, come, house of Jacob, let us walk in the light of the Lord. That's recorded in Isaiah chapter 2 and verse 5. We're going to see another very important verse from Isaiah for day 2. That as we've already mentioned, Yeshua himself has declared, I am the light of the world. Uh, he who follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have, and then notice the words again, will have the light of life. Do we begin to see the meaning developing here? And remember Isaiah said the people sat in darkness, but they saw a great light. That's referring to the nation of Israel. The light came into the nation of Israel, and those who came to the light saw the light and were saved. That is... The fulfillment of Isaiah's prophecy. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Let me take you to Yochanan, John chapter 1. I love John chapter 1. We all know in the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God, and the Word was God. Let me drop you down to verses 4 and 5 in John 1, Yochanan. In him was life, and life was the light of man. And the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not comprehend it. Remember what I said a little bit ago? The darkness is dispelled by the light. That's what it means by the darkness didn't comprehend it. The darkness couldn't understand it and absorb it and accept it. The darkness flees from it. The darkness goes away. So in verses 4 and 5, we have the life. The life was the light of myth. The darkness could not comprehend it. And verse 9 says, there was the true light which coming into the world enlightens every man. Wow. Do I see a picture of the word, the lamp into our feet, the light into our path, the one who brings the light and gives us life? He gives us life more abundantly when we come into the light. Life is precious. It is a precious gift from God, and in that we should realize how precious that God's Son came into this world to bring us light, to give us life. But he did it at the expense of giving his own life, what we do value, what is so precious. Staying with Yochanan, staying with John, chapter 11, verses 25 and 26, Yeshua, the one who we've been talking about in all of this, says, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me shall live even if he dies. And everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. Now, how can they die and not die? Because one's talking about the physical. The physical can die. But the spiritual, even when the physical dies, the spiritual lives. And that life goes on and lives with the light of the world if we have that faith in him. Are we seeing a beautiful picture of Messiah? And we're only on day one. Mm -hmm. I love it. Do I think that Yeshua is the light? Do I think that he came to give us abundant life? Do I think that he wants us to see him in our Hanukkah tradition? Oh yeah. I don't think we're reaching. I think it's right there. Open our eyes and let's see. Day two, they'll let these burn all the way down, by the way. You need a whole box for it if you're going to celebrate Hanukkah. Um, one box of candles that you buy, you will have just enough candles for each night uh, by the time it gets to the end. Because day one now has ended. And by the way, remember, days start at sundown. So they're gathering around the menorah at sundown. So tomorrow, Thursday, December 10th, sundown. 
they will gather around the menorah, light the first light. I guarantee you they're eating potato latkes. Mm. <laughs> if they can do the donuts, they're doing the donuts too. And sometimes they even exchange gifts. This is another reason between it being the 25th of Kislev, a celebration, a giving of gifts that people say, oh, it's a Jewish Christmas. No, yeah. it's not a Jewish Christmas. The only way that you can say that is when you recognize Christmas as the celebration of the light come into the world, and that light that came in was born of Jewish ethnicity, then yes, then I'll agree with you. There's your combination, but that's it. How long did the candles burn each night? It depends on your circumstances. If you're near a fan, they burn faster. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. I would say on their own half hour, probably about half hour. I, I don't think I've ever timed. But, uh, but we'd have fun, turn off the lights, have, so let the candles off, glow. You, you leave them, them and you let them burn all the way the down. Two, the two. Yes. And because each day you we're going to add all one again. More. All again. And with a oh, second so one. Yes. And, yes. Oh, oh, right. Yes. Ah, see, that's oh, what you'll see. Ah. If these had burned all the way down the two the and we're on day. the next day, day two, day I would two. be putting in a new servant candle. New servant candle. And you start all over. And then one and two. And then one, day two. Yes. Oh, you guys got it. And then we put ah, in, we put, I need to just leave this open. We put in it. the second one, second one and they'll take the light, the light, the, one the some two. say you light the new day first, but I wasn't raised that way, but yes. you're, that's fine if you do. Yes. If you go somewhere and you see it, that's fine. Because again, we have our family traditions and that that's all acceptable that I would go back to the first relight. Well, not relight cause that's burned all the way down, but uh -huh. the new candle, I light it again, and as I'm doing that and being the dad, I would remind the kids, this speaks of light or life. Now day two, I'm going to light it, and now we've got three candles burning on day two, and those three will burn all the way down, and then the next day we're going to have to put in the shamash, day one, day two, and day three. So that's why it, it takes 44 candles Gosh. to celebrate Hanukkah, and our boxes come with... 44 candles. Wow. <laughs> so you can see, you know, they, they've added all up. Now, I have to tell you just because I want a little uh, enjoyment in the midst of this also, my saying to you how I, I'm telling you it's not Christmas, it's not a Jewish Christmas, it's, it's a separation. This is a true story. Little boy named Les was Jewish. He went down to his friend's house in early December. He's about eight years old. He says he was eight or nine years old and his friend introduced him to the Christmas tree and his friend said look at you know we light this every night and you see all these gifts under here this one's got my name on it and this one's got my <laughs> name on it, and this and he's all excited he can hardly wait for Christmas to come when he's gonna get to open all of his gifts well what do you think a little eight-year-old boy <laughs> does Goes home to his mom that night. He says, Mama, Mama, I want to celebrate Christmas. I want a Christmas tree. Well, she was smart enough. She knew what was going on. She knew he wants the gifts under the tree. Right. Yeah. <laughs> so she says, Les, let me tell you. They celebrate that because that's their belief. But we have Hanukkah. Uh -huh. And we have eight nights. We're going to celebrate every single night, and you're going to get a gift every single night. Mm -hmm. So your little friend may get two or three, maybe even four <laughs> gifts, but you're going to get eight <laughs> gifts. <laughs> oh, <take that. laughs> Les goes to his friend the next day, and he's got no problem telling his friend, we celebrate Hanukkah, and his little friend goes home and says, Mama, Mama, I want Hanukkah. <laughs> Yes. Rowena wants to know if the candles are lit by the window. Yes, oh. good point. Thank you. The menorah is to go in a window. Oh, now, okay. when we light our candle ones, often we don't put that one in the window because of the dangers. If you've got a window that's set up where you can, then yes. Because the idea is the light is to go out to the world. Yes. We're to tell the world yes. of our celebration. We're to, to share it with the world. We include the world. They're welcome. Gentiles are welcome to come in and celebrate Hanukkah with us. Um, very often, a home has more than one Hanukkah. I don't even know how many I've got. Believe me, <laughs> I've got plenty. So I have the one that, that's more durable for playing with the kids and the kids sitting by the light and watching it go down. And I have the one that, that's in the window. 
and uh, there are even those today that will use the electric lights. You know, they look like our Christmas tree bulbs, yes. and they can turn those on. Those often are what you see in the windows because they're good and safe, you know, in the windows. And having said that, again, the light is to go out. We're not to keep the light in. We are to take the light to the world. Do I see that being what we're told to do? Yes. Absolutely. You're, you're, you're hitting day eight now. We'll come to that when we get there. But let, lest I forget, also, someone remind me when I get to day eight, and I've shared that. If I haven't talked too long, I'll share you another true story, a little more somber than, than the fun one. But uh, uh, the lights of um, the Hanukkah on a train taking a family out across, I don't remember, it started in Germany, but getting across the border to where they were going to be safe in one of the last trains that made it out safely. So remind me, I'll tell you that story. But right now, let's look at day two because we've lit day two, yes. so we need to talk about day two. Day two stands for reason. When we think about reason, that's what separates humankind from all other creatures. The fact that God, our creator, has given us the ability to reason, to think with our minds, and in that, then we should be using our minds. They should be a guiding light that brings us to our maker. Does this sound like Shabbat? Does this sound like the candles that we light there that are to remind us, to remember and recall? Our God of creation wants that relationship with us. And remember how we bring the light in because we see the fullness of the light? That it is the light that as we think brings us, wow, how could I have such a mind? There has to have been a master designer. There has to have been a master creator who has created. And if so, what does he want from us? He didn't make us puppets. But does he, are we just free to throw all care to the wind? Who cares that we've got a creator? No. He says, I want intimacy with you. I want a relationship with you. Isaiah, Yeshua 1, in verse 18 says, Come now, let us reason together. Use your mind, says the Lord. Remember, I'm always telling you, don't check your mind at the door. Bring your mind in. Use it. You God. You know, don't, don't lose your mind again a minute. You need your mind. Your brain is in it. Use that brain. Reason. Think. Come. Let us reason together, says the Lord. Though your sins are as scarlet, they will be as white as snow. Though they are red like crimson, they will be like wool. Yes, reason. Wow. Creator God. I want that relationship with you, but I've got something in the way, and that is what we all are born with, and that is what we call sin. And what is sin? It's not just murder and, and a big boo-boo. Sin is anything short of God's perfect, holy standard. <clears throat> so unless we're God's equal, we are sinners. We need to reason about that, think about that, and we need to come to that light that we can have that abundant life the light brought into us that we talked about in day one. What an invitation. What an opportunity. God has never left us drifting in on our own and unable to realize he is there. He is always calling us, encouraging us, drawing us, and willing, I love it, to give a fresh, clean slate. All sin washed away, all sin forgotten, start over brand squeaky new. Wouldn't you like to do that when you've pulled a big boo-boo? Wouldn't you love to just turn the clock back and, and start again, erase it so good that nobody can see it? Well, God does that with our sins. Erases it all. It says, what separated you and your relationship with me, it's now gone. It is so gone, it is so forgotten that I see you squeaky clean, brand new, and in a relationship with me. That's what we see in day two. Reason draws us in to, be, to know that we can know our maker in an intimate way because he has made that way available. He's made us pure. He's made us clean. He's put his robe of righteousness on us. It is not anything that we can do, but he has done it for us all. May we all come to Elohim, to God, to our maker, to not only forgive us, but from this point forward, help us in our reasoning that we might walk in the light 
of the lamp of the Word of God, in the light of the light that, that God has given us. If we walk in the light of His Word, we will not stumble. Isn't it a beautiful picture? Day three comes. I love day three. I love them all. Day three comes. I'm going to put red in here. That's kind of a icky red, but we're going to count it for right now because I don't want to take time whoops, to hunt for a better looking red. My uh, brighter colored candles disappeared on me, by the way. <laughs> I have no idea where they went. Day three, they take the shamash candle, the servant candle, remind how it is bending down, stooping to day one, to day two, and also has lit day three. So now they've got four brand new candles that are all burning down, all the way down again, and day three stands for truth. Truth. If we didn't have truth, we'd just stumble around in the darkness. Truth dispels that darkness. Truth brings freedom. Truth nourishes happiness. Truth opens one's eyes and points one to the way to fulfillment. Truth, Scripture says, sets one free. <clears throat> Yochanan John chapter 8 again, verse 32 this time. You shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. Truth frees us from the sin that confines us. Who is the truth? John 14, 6. I am the way, the truth, and the life. Oh, wait a minute. Day one was life. Day three is truth. Are we beginning to see the way? The truth definitely will bring the light into the life of man. It's a fulfilling life now. It goes all the way through eternity. When we come into the presence of the one we call Abba, we call him our Father, we come in through his divine Son, who we see represented as the servant right now, bringing us the light, dispelling that darkness in us, and bringing us to the beauty of the light. So we have light and life. Day one, we have reason day two, we have truth day three, and now we are ready for day four, and day four is beauty. That looks almost like i got to get some new colors out of here. Okay, let's try this one. A little different than day two. Day four is beauty. Day four is beauty. Beauty reminds us about the ability that Elohim, our God, has given us to appreciate the beauty that is all around us. He has created beauty for us, has he not? He's made a beautiful creation. Look at the flowers. Look at the animal life. Look at the people. He has created beauty. And realizing that, realizing that, that there's beauty around us should spark in us that there's something more because we should begin to be thinking about his beauty and wanting his beauty. That was the heart cry again of our king, Melch David, King David. In Psalm 27, 4, he says, One thing I've asked from the Lord that I shall seek, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life. Why did he want to dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of his life? Because he wanted to behold the beauty of the Lord. Have you not said... You can't wait to see the face of your Savior, the face of Yeshua, the, the beautiful face that we just imagine. Fanny Crosby wrote many of our hymns, Blind Since Birth, and someone was mourning that for her. And she says, ah, oh, honey, no. I'm glad I'm blind because the first thing I'll ever see is the face of my Savior. <laughs> yeah. Beauty. The most beautiful face, the most beautiful thing she could see will be her first reality of sight. Beauty, beauty. Eternal life in the presence of Elohim. For those that have come through the promise of, of the Son, the light of the world, the one who says he is the way, the truth, and the life. Well, let me just sum it up. He came to give us abundant life. Through using our minds, our reason, we come to the truth. That is, we come to Messiah, we come to Jesus, we can appreciate the beauty then of our God reflected in the one who has expressed image of the Father, who I'm talking about the Son, and we will allow His beauty to shine upon us. Then what do we reflect out? The beauty of our Lord. Have you ever seen a believer 
all wet and glowy and beautiful. And what are we saying? Oh, I see the Lord all over that person. I see the glory of the Lord in that person. That's what we're seeing. Psalm 90, verse 17 says, Let the beauty of the Lord our God be upon us. It even turns our ashes into something beautiful. Isaiah, Yeshua, chapter 61, verse 3, the first part, says to appoint unto those who mourn in Zion. Have you ever mourned? When you're mourning, you think sackcloth and ashes, tears. You don't see a beauty of that. But he says for those who are mourning in, in Jerusalem, that there is this day coming, that it's going to give, he, the Lord's going to give to them beauty out of the ashes. We talk about the beauty of Israel coming out of the ashes of the Holocaust. That's just a simple light picture. The beauty of the Lord when we come out of the ashes of our sin. Wow. Wow. And to enjoy that beauty forever in the presence of our Creator promised to all who come to the Lord, well, nothing could be more beautiful than that. And that leads us right into day five, and I love to use red for day five. I'm going to see if I've got a brighter red in here, and I'm not sure I do in this box. Well, we're going to call this red. <laughs> day five, uh-oh, we're going to find one that isn't broken. Good thing I'm not doing the whole box right now. I'd be in trouble. <laughs> that one broke if you didn't. Okay. Uh -huh. My red ones are weak. We're going to hope that stays. I think it'll be okay. Day five, and I may have to cheat and use another shamash candle, but day five, as we light our new day, the children are taught by the, their father again. This day stands for love. They say it's the warmest candle out of them all. Love. Love. Love, love is the reward of life. To love and to be loved is the greatest gift. And we see it perfectly exemplified in the life-giving, atoning work of our God. When we see that, I'm talking about the Son. I'm talking about Mashiach, Messiah, our Savior. I'm talking about Leviticus, Viagra 17, 11, where we're told, For the life of the flesh is in the blood. And I have given it to you on the altar to make an atonement for your souls, for it is the blood that makes an atonement for the soul. The life is in the blood. The blood that was shed, Messiah shed his blood on that cross. He came to give us life. That's why I said he came to die. That was the reason why he came. That he might resurrect and give us that abundant, resurrected, powerful life in the light of his love. Greater love has no man than this, that he lay down his life for his friends. Yochanan, John 15, 13. And later, Yochanan, same author, but in the little books in the back of your Bible called 1 John. He, he's the, the apostle of love. He writes love, 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 love all the way through. Chapter 4, verses 9 and 10 says, By this the love of God was manifested in us, that God has sent his only begotten Son into the world so that we might live through him. Is this In this is love. Not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation, to be the atonement that Leviticus talked about for our sins. Love is the warmest candle. It glows the brightest, and love warms our heart when we let the sun shine in. And I mean the S-O-N, sun mm -hmm. shine in. No greater gift and no greater love that can we bask in the warmth of the love of our God through accepting the atoning work of His Son? Oh, yes, we can. I love day five. Oh. Okay, day six. We might make it to the end before our shamash candle is gone. <laughs> we'll see. Day six stands for justice. Now, if you know the Jewish mind, justice is huge for the Jewish people because so much injustice has happened to our Jewish people throughout their whole history, that they have an expression well known in our secular Jewish world, not just by the religious, but in our secular, and that is justice, justice shalt thou pursue. Where do they get that? We're supposed to go after justice. Well, I think they get it from Psalm, from Tehillim, chapter 82 and verse 3. 
We are told there, what are we to do? We are to do justice to the afflicted and to the needy. That means that we mete out justice to those who are suffering injustices. We are to be bringing justice to the world. Micah chapter 6 and verse 8 says, He has told you, O man, what is good. What does the Lord require of you? But to do justice, to love kindness, to walk humbly with your God. If you're doing that, you're going to be like a servant. You're going to be acting humbly, and you're going to deal justly with everyone. Not only do the Jewish people not want to be wronged because they've suffered wrongness at the hands of so many, but they want to make sure that they meet out justice to others, that they don't deal wrongly with others. So they are taught justice is important. You act in justice. No matter what's done to you, you act in justice. And what is justice if it's not truth in action? You're dealing truly and fairly. You're not cheating people. You're not harming people. You're not using and abusing. You are treating all with justice. This is where we see the great lesson of the human race. It doesn't say deal with the Jewish people justly. It says deal with all people justly. In this, there's no color and there's no Jew or Gentile. There's just one race of people, the human race, and we should deal justly with all. We see that the one who came, who was the truth, brought justice to all. We don't see the Lord deal unfairly with anyone. And when we see all the way through the judgments in Scripture, through at the end of time, you will always see he deals justly. He deals fairly. He deals right, and he deals in truth. The, the ones who've done wrong are not going to get, oh, it's okay, and the ones who do right suffer the consequences. That will be gone. What will be meted out will be justice for those of us who have come into the light, who have those sins forgiven. Our judgment went with it. We only receive judgment to be blessed with reward, not to get what, if we get his mercy, we don't get what we deserve. And we do get what we don't deserve. Mercy and grace. Ultimately, the gift of justice in replacing our sins is when we come through that atoning blood. So the solution for forgiveness, the solution for just acting and living out justly and all, that is by acting in the way that we see Yeshua act. Isaiah 53 and verse 6 says, All of us sheep have gone astray. We've all done things wrong. Each of us has turned to our own way. But the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. That's where he has taken the wages of our sin that is death. But the gift that he's given, the gift of God, is eternal life through Yeshua Jesus. Remember day one? Life. This is how we get life, is through that atoning forgiveness, that shedding of that blood. We come to Elohim, we come to our God through Yeshua, through Jesus, to be given justice through his blood. That means we're given eternal life. So justice Hallelujah. means fairness? Because just I always right. battled, I always thought God wasn't very fair, but I knew he was just. Because I see children starving over here, and I see children over here that's obese, you know. <laughs> And you have to wonder if there's a fairness in the world. There is not a fairness in this world. God did not do that. God did not say, I'm going to make this one starve and I'm going to make this right. one fat. That's not God's uh -huh. work. That's man's that's doing and that's the effects of sin in this world that have caused these injustices. Yes. When God made the world for humankind, he made the Garden of Eden. There would have been no famine. There would have been no suffering. There would have been no pain. So, so this world is not fair and just. And don't look for your fairness mm -hmm. and your justice in this world. You will not find it. You've got a Hitler that, that kills for, for no other reason than being Jewish. And it looks like he got away with it. But no, he will stand before his God. And he will pay for the 6 million Jews. He will pay for the, what, 50, 50? I don't remember how many million others, you know, that were that lost their lives in that war also. He will stand trial for that, and he will be meted out a punishment that is worthy of that. Where someone who has not lived a life of harm to others, but never accepted their God, will still have to suffer the consequences of rejection of the God that they should have embraced, 
but they won't suffer in the same way that Hitler will suffer. How God determines that, we talk about it being different degrees of hell. I don't know any other way to put it, but we see different degrees of suffering today. You'll see different degrees of punishment in hell. That's where the justice comes, but we are to act out justly as much as we can. That's right judging. That's um, fair, being fair, being right, being true. That's not letting evil get away with evil, but it's not inflicting evil when we should inflict good also. And we should all strive for that. That's what it's telling us. We should try to live justly toward all people. Do you think if the Jews had accepted Jesus, maybe so many of them wouldn't have had to gone through the Holocaust? Well, the Holocaust awakened the Jewish nation to be reborn in a day in the land. That's mm -hmm. what God brought out of the Holocaust. If they had not gone through the suffering, they had nowhere on the face of this earth that they could call home and supposedly live safe. I have to say that supposedly because Israel today still fights for her survival in her own land. But that's why the, the homeland was made for her again, was so that the Jews had a place to call home that would be their home, that would be uh, the place for them to live as Jews. It's, it's a good start, but it won't be true until Messiah is sitting on the throne on earth and the will of heaven being done on earth, which is promised to Israel and will come. But anytime you see Israel as a nation suffering the consequences, what they're suffering the consequences of is that they're not following their God. They're not in obedience to their God. So his hand of protection and safety is not over them. They're suffering the consequences. When they went into Babylonian captivity, it was because they had fallen into idolatry. They were worshiping other gods. They were not taking care of the poor and the needy in the land. They were being selfish and living into them themselves. They suffered consequences of that, yes. Mm -hmm. um, it's like Meshach, Shadrach, and Abednego. God was right there to protect them. Yes, and that's a good example. they were living righteously before him. Right, that's a good example of how it will be in totality. But let me caution you. There are people living right and just and good and fair lives today. Yeah. who suffer because of this world, who lose their lives from a murder, who are run over by a car, who are hit and killed in a car accident. Mm -hmm. We cannot say, oh, they weren't right and they're being judged. This world doesn't see that mm -hmm. fairness and that justice now. Mm -hmm. That's what will be seen in the eternal judgment before our God. That that's happening now when good happens to bad people and bad happens to good people, what we are seeing is the effects of sin in this world. Where God has said, okay, you didn't want me as your God. You didn't choose to be, you know, right before me. The whole earth is going to suffer the consequences of it. When Adam and Eve failed and they were judged, death entered into their physical bodies, mm -hmm aging, all of that process, the earth also was cursed. The earth is under a curse. It didn't produce thorns and thistles. It didn't have drought time. It didn't have these consequences in the Garden of Eden. But sin brought that all into the world. And again, we can, even living right, we can suffer the consequences of sin now, but I guarantee you, in the eternal time, God will more than make the balance of that. More than make up for that. How? <laughs> Just watch my God. <laughs> I can't begin to tell you how, but I guarantee you, those who have suffered persecution are given a crown of life. Yeah. That may sound little right now, but when we see that in a way that God produces it and shows it and they feel it and they receive it, they're going to say, that was worth it all. That, that was nothing compared to what we have now. So I don't want anybody to go out from this and say everybody who suffers is because they, they're not right before their God. No. Daniel was right before his God and went into captivity. The three men that went into the fiery furnace stood for their God. They were right before their God. He brought them through that, but some were not brought through. We have the, the chapter of faith where there were those who were devoured by lions. Daniel was spared, but there were those who were. We have... All, and the Christians that were eaten by lions. Yes. If you can read Fox's Book of Martyrs, my hat's off to you. I can't even read it. It grieves me so. And, and also when uh, Israel declined to let the ground follow for seven years? 
they, they were disobedient to God. Yes, they were. The, the land was to have its Shabbat, its time of rest. They didn't. So God said, okay, you skipped it 49 times. I'm going to give it to you all at once. Mm -hmm. I said that wrong. <laughs> <laughs> it's 490 years that they didn't do it. It was 70 times that it was skipped. So God gave the land 70 years of Shabbat, of, um, of peace, of rest, before he let them go back into the land. But, uh, yeah, so God's justice will be seen, but not always in the immediate now. Mm -hmm. But it will be seen. Mm -hmm. Okay? I'm going to have to hurry now because <laughs> I'm losing my servant candle. <laughs> um, but we'll, I want to give our last two days. I think I have covered it. Um, yeah, we come to, to God for um, the forgiveness of our sins, and we're given that justice. You know, but we will not necessarily see that justice in its um, acting, acting out, in its action, in its fulfillment till we are home. You know, some, some do. Some suffer horribly with cancer. Others never sick a day in their life, you know. You That's why we can't say, you know, that this was, no, it's a consequence of sin. It wasn't the way it would have been in the Garden of Eden if sin had never entered. And it's what will be in God's eternal world when we get past, and we'll come to that finally, we're getting there, we're getting, we're almost through, you know, we're into the millennium now, when we come back in January, we're into the millennium, <laughs> so we're almost to where we'll see God's perfection, but let's go ahead and do day seven, I'm going to, to cheat in the way that I'm doing it, my serving candle's supposed to, oh, okay, well if you can do that, go ahead, go ahead, he's going to get it out for me, I was going to just bend my other candles down, very good. Very good. Oh, don't let the hot bar It's a burrowet. <laughs> and I'm going to take our day of love and light my servant candle. There we go. Okay, so thank you, Roger. The man of the hour, as always. So, day seven. Day seven. How we say I love it. Each day, I love, just like in the Bible, whatever book I'm studying, I'm in love with. <laughs> day seven is shalom. Mm -hmm. Shalom is a word we're very familiar with. The world rests when it has justice and truth, we will see peace. When we see that truth in action, that justice being acted out, then there is shalom. Shalom, justice and, truth. justice and truth are days three and days six. It brings us to shalom, day seven. Okay? And I'll, when I get to eight, I'll go back through them all one last time and bring it all together there in the end. But shalom, that's the peace. That's, I mean, that peace is what it means, literally. That's the heart cry of the Jewish people as a whole. That's why they greet you with peace. They leave you with peace. That's their hello and goodbye. They're saying, we welcome you in peace. And then when you're going, they say, go in peace. And they're meaning in the peace of God, if they have a belief in God at all. And they want a world that lives in peace. That's why you ask, well, Golda Meir said, when the Arabs love their children more than they hate the Israelis, then we'll have peace. But it's hard to find that peace today apart from the one who brings us peace. Will it ever be true for the Jew? I can give a resounding yes. Jewish people, I read the final chapter. Your peace as a whole, as a nation, will come. How will peace come as a whole to the nation of Israel? Is the world finally going to say, okay, Israel, you have a right to exist. You can have your land. No, we know we're going into a time, and I see the setting up for it like I've never seen it before, a time when they're going to want to divide that land in the guise of peace, a time when they're going to try to say, we're going to split you up, and, and then there'll be peace. The Jews will have their part, the Arabs will have their part. Well, hello, there's 22 Arab states now. What do you think yes. another Arab state's going to do, bring peace? No, all they want is the P-I-E-C-E -E called Israel. They don't want P-E-A-C-E. -E. So how can I say to our Jewish people, you will have peace? How can I give them any hope? How can I hold it out to them? Because we know the day is coming when the Prince of Peace will come from heaven, will come down to this earth, will come into Jerusalem. We just studied it last class. He will stop the battle on the Mountain of Olives and, and well, almost the entire um, north-south 
At the geographic location of Israel, he will stop the battle called the Battle of Armageddon. He will set up his kingdom sitting on an earthly throne, the throne of David, in Jerusalem, in Jerusalem, comma, Israel. Not, not Jerusalem, comma, Palestine. Not Jerusalem, comma, West Bank or any other names that they try to put on any of these areas. It will be Israel. It will be what God has <coughs> promised. So the nation of Israel will see that peace in the day to come but to every Jewish person now. Do you have to wait for that day and hope that you're alive in that day to see it, to gain that peace? No. The same is for every dear Gentile person also. Each individual can find peace today, can find shalom, and they find it by coming to the one who says, I give peace. When we read, recorded by Yochanan, John chapter 14 and verse 27, Yeshua Jesus says, Peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you, not as the world gives, do I give to you. Let not your heart be troubled, nor let it be fearful. Yeshua gives shalom. Yeshua gives peace. Accepting his work, <coughs> accepting his shed blood in your place, accepting his atonement for your sins, taking this to, we call my poor candle. We call it the foot of the cross. <laughs> Stand straight and true and pure and tall because that's who you're representing, Shamish Candle. <laughs> you are relieved of your burdens at the foot of the cross. You are given the, the freedom that you are desiring. All of this will be true. You will have life. You will have light. You will be able to reason that you come to your creator God in the way that he's established through the truth because the truth will set you free, will give you the beauty of the Lord inside out, bringing you love on a level unknown by humankind. Even the greatest love a human shows, God's love is greater through giving himself, his son, to be the propitiation for our sins. That will give us justice. We will see God meet out and make everything right as it should have been in that final end with him, which brings us to the shalom, to the peace of our God. Then we can say, be anxious for nothing, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God and the peace of God, the shalom of God, which surpasses all comprehension, everything your mind can comprehend, everything it can reason, it will guard your hearts and your minds in Messiah and Yeshua, in Mashiach Jesus, in, in, in Yeshua Jesus. That's Philippians 4, 6, and 7. Yeshua, Isaiah 26, 3 tells us he will keep him in shalom, shalom, in perfect peace, whose mind is stayed on thee because he trusts in the if you put your faith and your trust in God you will be filled with his shalom you will be filled with it in the midst of circumstances that would speak anything but peace but he will give it individually the nation will see a thousand years of peace when he rules on this earth called the millennial kingdom all the rest of the nations will be blessed through Israel that has King Yeshua sitting on the throne of David. All the promises of that eternal kingdom given to Israel will be fulfilled. Second Shmuel, Second Samuel 7, Zechariah, Zechariah chapter 14. We're now in Revelation chapter 20 when we see the millennium. All these fulfilled. Everything God promised will be fulfilled. But we can come to Yeshua now. And we can have his peace now, no matter our circumstances. Israel will see her future is glorious. That's why I tell Israel, I've read the final chapter. No worries. You will have King Yeshua sit on the throne. But you can know it, putting him on the throne of your life now. That will give you shalom, shalom. And it will take us to, and I'm just going to get any candle in here quickly because my poor candles are really <laughs> melting horribly. They want to bow down. They're, yes, but this one's to stay straight. That's the only one that I care about staying straight. And it's not, and I don't know why it's not. I've never had one quite this bad. There we go, probably because I've worked with it so many times. Day stands for future. It stands for eternity. It stands for all the hope, all that is infinite, all its possibilities. 
That's the unknown future. And if you're afraid of the future, you can trust your future to the all-knowing God. You don't know your future, but He does. And He is there as the all-knowing God to guard and to guide you. Guard you into to keep that keep your mind, your thought about him that he can cover you with his shalom. That he also tells us the steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord. Remember when we started, thy word is a light unto my feet and a lamp unto my path. Or I may have said that backwards, but you know the verse. That's what I see in Psalm 37, 23. Every step he lights the way. We don't have to worry about stepping wrong or stepping out or stepping where we shouldn't go. We, if we follow the Lord, he guides every step of our future, every step for us all the way through into eternity. Yeshia, Isaiah 55, 8 and 9 tells us his ways are higher than our ways, his thoughts than our thoughts. And that's a comforting promise to us. If he only had our level, it would be a mess. But he sees the entire, and he's working the entire, and he it, he is infinite. He, there's nothing that confines him, nothing that stops his flow, his love, his plan. Nothing thwarts it, not even COVID. That's not an accident he doesn't know what to do with. And he is bringing people to him through that. His promises for all times, for all those who believe, are recorded in the New Covenant. We read it in Ephesians 3, 20 and 21, that he's able to give us abundantly above all that we think or ask, even, even what we think. Philippians 4, 19 tells us that according to his riches, he supplies our needs. Well, let's see how rich he is. Do I need to worry about his riches running out? <laughs> Uh, somebody once said that he owns the cattle on a thousand hills. Mm -hmm. Well, then if I need a little bit of money, God, can you sell a cow? <laughs> you can't out, out, you can't outdo use him. up, outdo. Yeah, outdo. You can't use up God's no. riches. They, he's the owner of the universe. He's the creator of the universe. Abundant. It, abundant. It doesn't end. If he needed to, he created out of nothing. He did create out of nothing. And he did provide out of nothing. We see that in our miracles that took place. And the future for us in him is, is a future and a hope. It's bright. Near me at Jeremiah 29, 11. They were going to go into captivity when Jeremiah said to his people, I know the future that God has for you. I know the plans mm -hmm. he has for you to give you a future, to give you a hope. Yes, you're going to go into captivity. You're going to learn your lesson. You're going to cry out to your God, and he's going to rescue you. That's our God. And so for all who put their faith in Messiah and Yeshua, all who come to the light and, and have the life, reason it, and that reasoning brings them to truth, that truth brings them to the, the beauty of the Lord and following him that gives us his love in our lives that warms us and that guides us to deal justly with others and to know that justness will come in the future that gives us shalom in the midst of our storm that gives us an infinity infinity like my car it forever <laughs> infinity yeah. it goes on I tell the Lord that car has got to go to the rapture because of its name <laughs> <laughs> that's what we have and that's what we see reflected in the lights now these lights they're going to flicker we see that they're going to die out in time but we renew ourselves each night we refresh ourselves we rededicate ourselves remember this is the feast of dedication and in that when we come into that renewing and that refreshing in our God then we can face that future and see hope in it and come into the glories of the riches that he has for us that we don't wait for till then. They start, I stepped on a kitty, they start now and they fill us now. The light will be in us. The light will be reflected. That's what we're to do is to shine this light out for others to see. The nearer we get to him, the closer we get to him, the more that light will shine in us. The more intense it is, because that it just it it takes over us. It it transforms us into something glorious, because we're moving from glory to glory in His glory, being conformed to His image. 
around the turn of the 20th century, there was a nickname given to a certain group of people. They were called one-way missionaries. Do you know what a one-way missionary was? Mm -hmm. This amazed me when I read it. A one-way missionary made a plan to go to a foreign land to share the truth of what I've been sharing, the gospel of Yeshua Jesus, with that people group. They went with the intent that they will go and serve the Lord there until they die. They're not coming back. That's why they were called one way. That makes sense. Do you know what they did, though? They took the belongings they needed to go with them. They packed the belongings, get this, in a coffin. And that coffin was to be used to bury them in that foreign land. That was a one-way missionary at the turn of the 20th century. They wow. knew they weren't returning home, and that's how dedicated they were to going. Wow. One of those one-way missionaries, his name was Peter Milne, M-I-L-N-E. He went to a tribe of headhunters in the area called New Hebrides, H-E-B-R-I-D-E-S. All the other missionaries that had gone before him had been martyred. They, none of them had lived a full life. They had all been killed by these headhunters that he felt God call him to go to share the love of Yeshua with these headhunters. The tribe that had martyred all the others before finally came to believe in the Lord that Peter Milne represented. And someone who came along after him, years later after he had died, there was a picture in a, a building honoring Peter Milne. Mm -hmm. And underneath it said, when he came, there was no light. When he left, there was no darkness. Mm -hmm. wow. He shined the light of the Lord. Wow. He was a one-way missionary. <clears throat> I can't wait to meet him one day because he's alive. He's in that glorious future that the Lord has promised Take to all us all. Steps to get the right one. Yeah. Well, it's it's the building. It's the building. The the story of a missionary that was going door to door, and it was a female missionary, and it was a female that answered the door, and then the one in the house knew what her intent was. She she um, t told her, "I don't want to hear it," and she closed her door. The next day, the missionary went back, and knocked on the door again. The woman opened the door, and she says, "I told you, I don't want to hear it." just go away and this time she slammed the door in her, in her face the next day the missionary went back and knocked on that door again and this time the lady spit on her and slammed the door shut oh the God. next day the missionary went back and knocked on the door again the woman threw open the door and she says i want to hear what you have to say whatever you've got that made you come back when i treated you the way i did i want that too come in sit down tell me all about it oh my and goodness. she got saved so wow. those who mar were martyred before Peter, they were the stepping stones to this tribe, wow. finally accepting. Don't give up, people. If you've got those you've been sharing with for years, don't give up. Where there's life, there's hope. You never know when it's going to just all come together and, and they're going to catch sight of the love and invite it into their lives. So, um, hey, one more, too. You want to do the one about the nail? Oh, I, I could. Let me end on the, because I'm really out of time. Let me end on um, the, the story I told you I was going to tell real fast about the Hanukkah lights, and then I'll go to that one if so. There's also, if I can find it, and I maybe I just won't worry about it. There was something else that one of our people said. Um, they Basically what they said, it was a rabbi that said that, that he believed one day there was going to come a light. Well, that's what Isaiah said, and we know the light did come. And we're here to reflect that light to others. The story, the, the family that was um, running for their lives, they had gotten onto the train. It was Hanukkah time. They were on the train undercover. Their papers did not say they were Jewish, and they were hoping they were right under the, the nose of the Nazis. Nazis were all over. The train even pulled into this station in particular, and more Nazi soldiers uh, of authority got onto that train. Families just holding their breath, you know, hoping, praying to God that they're going to get out safely. If they're caught, it's, it's all over. Well, when the, the train was still in the station, there was a power failure. Um, what I failed to tell you before is because the, the father of this family was Orthodox, very concerned that he followed 
the the um, the holy days. I I've got to say the holidays because Hanukkah is not one of the holy days listed. But feeling compelled that they had to celebrate Hanukkah wherever they were, they had what were called traveling candles because this is you know before the, our lights like we have, and they were using those candles as a menorah. The father set them up in the window of the train like a little menorah and used the one to light the others and was quietly teaching the children. The mother was horrified. She thought, oh, we're going to be caught for sure. They're going to see it's a menorah. You know, it's going to be our death. And the father said, then if we die, that was God's choice for us to die. I have to honor my God. I have to light the lights. So they did it. And sure enough, in no time, here's a knock on their door because now there's this power failure and their light is brightly shining in this power failure. And the mother and father both thought, this is it. You know, this, this is it, but, you know, that we're honoring our God to the last breath. And it was one of the head soldiers, um, I don't know what to call him, but, you know, one of the authorities, and he said, we've seen your lights. We need to do our paperwork. Could we use your... Um, what do you call it on the train? Your, you know, your station, your little, you know, could we use mm -hmm. your, where you are and your, your, your lights to work by? Well, what are they going to say? No. <laughs> you know, of course. Oh, they yeah. Said, yeah, of course they said yes. And they said, in exchange, we will see you all the way through to safety. And the Nazis escorted this Jewish family to safety to a country that was free, never knowing that by the lights of the menorah, they did their work and spared this Jewish family. That's amazing. Now, many others lost their lives. Yes. That's why I say it's not a, a right and a wrong, a rhyme and a reason that we can see now that God will see justice done in the end. The story that Roger wanted me to share with you is um, the missionary gone to a tribal area. Again, this is not in 20th century, 21st century like we are today with all kinds of connections. When you were a missionary out there, you were on your own out there. He had talked enough to the chief of the tribe, and this is where, as the chief goes, so goes the people. Um, he had talked enough to him about salvation. The chief was pretty well convinced, but he was just having a hard time wrapping his mind around because this was an area that was very, I'll, I'll use the word backward just to hurry my story. So he finally said to the missionary, he says, you know, I think if I could just see a nail, then, then maybe I could believe. But a nail, you know, I, I don't get this nailing him to the cross. I need to see a nail to believe. Well, the missionary went back to his hut thinking, Lord, how do I get a nail in the middle of nowhere? How can I show him? Tell me how to reach this, this chief. And he left in prayer, and he went to prepare his dinner that night. He'd taken with him some, some things for survival, you know, some food and all. So he had taken uh, canned food because what else is good out there? And he had his can opener, and he opened up his can, and he dumped the contents out over the pot that's over the, the fire because that's how primitive they were. And when he poured the contents out, he heard a clink. What clinks out of a can? You know, I mean, it's soup or whatever. What's clinging? Clinking. So he pulled the pot back from the fire and stirred to find out what's in it, and he pulls out of that can a nail. A what? A nail. Oh. In the middle of the jungle, the the one can he picks for dinner that night, on the day that the chief had said to him, if I could see a nail, I could believe. Oh my and he goodness. cleaned up that nail, and he oh took it to the chief, oh and he said, gosh. this is a nail. Oh. And the chief believed. Oh. The tribe turned to the Lord. Our God is an awesome God. Wow. His light shines in the jungles. Creation tells the people where they do not hear by a church on every corner that there is a God who wants a relationship with them. God gave the mind, come, let us reason. If they come to the light, God gives them more light. If they come to that light, he gives them even more light. There is no one without an excuse. The, the candle lighting of the menorah that we enjoy, I believe, fully embraces the one who says, I am the light of the world. He that comes to me will not walk in darkness. 
That is our Hanukkah. That is the story of our lights. I went just as long. I should have known better. I should have started earlier. <laughs> Forgive me for the length, but I hope it's been a blessing to each and every one of you. I'm going to close, and then we'll open it up to sharing. But uh, I, again, um, he is awesome. He is amazing. I pray that you are warmed by his light that gives us abundant life. Let's pray. Lord God, we thank you that you are the light of the world, that you come and you shine in every nook and cranny, that there is no darkness where your light comes because the darkness has to flee. Lord, we pray for any who do not know this light, that are still in darkness, that their eyes would be open to the truth, they would come to know the love, they would reason with their minds, and they would see the beauty that you have brought to us to bring us shalom, to bring beauty out of the ashes, to give us a new life, a clean slate, to start again fresh and new with the light of our Creator God in us, that we might shine it out for the world to see. Lord, let us who do have you in us be a light to the world, be that testimony that they can see this in action, that those without will come to the light and those with will be blessed to continue to share the truth that does set one free. You are amazing. You are awesome. You do give us life and you give it to us abundantly and we praise you for it forever and ever and embrace and look forward to the future, to the eternity with our God where we will see you face to face. Hallelujah. Praise your holy name. Amen. Amen.